In the last video session, what we found out is in 1862, what you had was the um, the the high moment, the uh, the Confederacy riding high when it comes to momentum in the Civil War. Um, the Confederacy, the South, that is, was winning most of the battles. Uh, clearly, the momentum, uh, the morale, was on the side of the Confederacy. Um, that'll change, and 1863 is an important year in the context of this change. Now, it's not very often that I ask you to commit a date to your notes, but 1863 is a pretty important date in our class, especially when it comes to the Civil War. The very nature of the Civil War is going to change in 1863. Now, what I mean has everything to do with emancipation. Now, we've been talking about this for several um, um, uh, lectures now, the idea of setting slaves free, and it came in various forms and fashions. Well, leading up to 1863, the U.S. Army had noted a, um, a very uh, interesting trend, that, uh, that the further they advanced into Confederate territory, they, they managed to pick up a lot of runaway slaves. And what I mean by that is that the runaway slaves would camp behind the Union Army, well, if you think about it, this means that this makes an enormous amount of sense. If you're a slave catcher, the last place in the world that you're going to be is around the Union Army, considering they're basically your sworn enemy. So in 1862, this gets kicked up to the chain of command, and ultimately Abraham Lincoln uh, passes the, uh, uh, the Confiscation Act of 1862. Um, it describes slaves as contraband, uh, enemy contraband, and therefore they can be confiscated. And really what you mean by that is set free. Uh, basically, if you manage to make your way into the Union lines, uh, you're home free, you're off the hook, so to speak. Okay. Well, in 1863, all of this really comes to a head with the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, it's very important that you stay very close to me on this and pay close attention, considering the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't do what you may think it does. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation does set slaves free. It's Abraham Lincoln uh, issuing this proclamation that says slaves will be free in the territories that are still under rebellion with the government. So in other words, it sets slaves free in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Virginia, where it does not set slaves free would be Kentucky. Um, it would also be a place like New Orleans, right, which was clearly a part of the Confederacy, but it was also um, um, being controlled by the Union Army at, at that particular moment. So it does not, I repeat, does not set slaves free everywhere, but it is a precedent in the sense that the federal government has outlawed the institution that was slavery. In a lot of ways, it's some foreshadowing of what is going to come later on toward the end of the war. Okay. Um, essentially, what I need you to understand, Abraham Lincoln is using the issue of emancipation as an instrument of war. Now, there are other people that um, can see that there's real potential here with this. Um, one of those, uh, a group of those individuals, are the abolitionists in uh, Massachusetts. The governor of Massachusetts, a guy by the name of uh, John Andrews, um, had, had long been a proponent of allowing black men the ability to fight to enlist in the U.S. Army. Um, it was their country. Uh, they were fighting for a cause that was near and dear to them. Keep in mind, in 1863, what happens is, you know, now slavery is very much explicitly a part of the war effort. The problem is Abraham Lincoln, and generally Republicans broadly defined, are hesitant to really warm up to this initiative. They don't necessarily want blacks to fight. Okay, it's, it's controversial for a number of different reasons. We didn't exactly understand how the Confederacy would react to all of this. But in any case, uh, what you need to be mindful of here is being able to enlist and to serve your country um, in our day and age. I mean, 21st century has been defined as a right. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman or what your sexual orientation is, let alone the color of your skin. We define that as a right. And so ultimately, Lincoln caves into the pressure, which is now also being mounted on him by Frederick Douglass to allow black men to fight. 
Um, he commissions the 54th Massachusetts, which is the first all-black regiment in the U.S. Army. Okay, This is a really, really big deal, considering it demonstrates something else. It demonstrates that African Americans, whether they be free people of color or runaway slaves, understand what's happening here in the American Civil War and are willing to not only fight, but to die for this, to pay the ultimate sacrifice. And so anyway, this is really beginning to shed more and more light on the idea of human equality in American life. Okay, um, More of that in a little bit. But 1863 is also an important turning point because that's finally the year that Lincoln is able to get some very significant military victories. Now, as you know, um, even though they didn't make a whole lot of headlines back in the East, the, the fighting in the West had been going quite well for the Northern Army, the, the, the Army of the Potomac, um, well, actually it's not that army, but the Union Army, uh, up until 1863. It wasn't getting a whole lot of press, but as I mentioned the other day, that's really where the war is won. And the Battle of Vicksburg in Mississippi is another confirmation of that. Now, Vicksburg's approximately halfway uh, down the state of Mississippi. It's right in the central part of Mississippi, at least on the western edge near the Mississippi River. And um, it's a very key Union victory. Again, I'm not a real big military historian, so if you want more of that, you're going to have to consult the History Channel or something along those lines. But anyway, what I'd like you to understand about Vicksburg, and I want you to write this down, the reason it's an important Union victory is that it cuts the Confederacy in two. Okay? It gives the Union Army a commanding control of the Mississippi River, and in doing so, it cuts off Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas from participating in the war. They, they can't send troops or supplies to those armies out in the east, so it's really beginning to kind of put Lee in a chokehold, even though those ramifications of this victory won't be felt for at least another year. Okay. Now, the other important victory that I need you to be mindful of would be the Battle of uh, Gettysburg, okay? Now, if you ever get a chance, um, you should go to the Gettysburg Memorial in Pennsylvania. Um, if you do that, you'll understand almost immediately why the North was able to win that victory, okay? As I just mentioned, Gettysburg is actually in Pennsylvania, so once again, what you've got in 1863 is Lee and the Confederates taking the offensive, trying to punch a hole in the Union Army line and run all the way to Washington and seize the Capitol, win the war. The problem was Lee got there late to the battlefield, late, and instead of taking the high ground, which was always infinitely more desirable, he managed to have to settle for the low ground. And the Union Army really settled in at a place called Little Round Top, okay? And this gave them the advantage of fighting from the high ground. And so on day one, Lee tried to flank, and it was repelled. Day two, uh, I flanked to the opposite end, and it was repelled. And on day three, he came right at the Union Army, uh, under the command of George Meade. Um, and it was repelled from directly in front of them. Long story short, Lee suffered very considerable casualties and retreated back into Virginia. Now, the Battle of Gettysburg is important for a number of different reasons, but one of the reasons is this is going to be the last time that the Confederacy will go on the offensive. It's a very key Union victory in the sense that Lee is never going to invade the North again. And what it demonstrates is that the best that the Confederacy can hope for is to fight on long enough to make war so miserable that the, that the North negotiates some sort of settlement, some sort of, sort of truce. Okay. Now, after the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln delivers his Gettysburg Address, which you had to read for a quiz. The Gettysburg Address changes the nature of the war because Lincoln mentions uh, various aspects, democratic, small d, democratic ideals of the American Revolution, that our country was premised on the idea of human freedom and human equality, and here we are immersed in this great civil war, uh, challenging whether that freedom and equality will hold up. And so what he's saying is we have to have this new birth of freedom if the country is going to become all one thing or all another thing. 
And so therefore, really what he's talking about is an end of slavery. And that's the significant aspect of the Gettysburg Address. It not only references the American Revolution and these democratic principles, it also basically says, look, there's some unfinished business of the American Revolution. Which is why a lot of historians, myself included, consider the Civil War to be America's second uh, revolution. I mean, we got halfway there the first time around when people of common birth were considered free and equal. Um, we'll get there all the way, or at least on paper all the way, with the American Civil War when we eliminate the institution that a lot of historians consider to be America's original sin, which is slavery. Okay? Anyway, 1864, with this momentum, cons continues on the Union's behalf. Um, Lee got Union victories in 1863. In 1864, what he got was capable Union generals. Now, let me make something clear. The North had every advantage that you could want in warfare. They had more people, so they had a numeric advantage. They had more factories, so that they could produce. Uh, the South couldn't claim that. They had more banks, so they could borrow more money from up there. Okay, they had a better navy. Um, the one thing that they lacked was real, capable, aggressive generals. And that'll change in 1863 when uh, the U.S. gets Ulysses S. Grant, Unconditional Surrender Grant, U.S. Grant. Grant wasn't any kind of military mastermind. Don't get me wrong, he was good, but he, he was not exactly some Dwight Eisenhower or somebody along those lines. What he understood was that there was a numeric advantage, and um, sure, when you engage the enemy directly and, 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 and purposefully, you are going to suffer casualties, possibly even heavy casualties. But the thing of it is, you also inflict casualties. The more aggressively you go after your enemy, the more casualties you will inflict. And because you have a numeric advantage, it's going to be much more difficult for them to make up ground with these heavy casualties than it is for you to make up that ground, okay? It's important that you understand Grant understood how to exploit the numbers, and that being said, he follows Lincoln's orders infinitely better than any U.S. general has in the Civil War up until this point, okay? Now, the other guy that Lincoln gets is a guy by the name of William Tecumseh Sherman. You know, in, in every society that's had a strong and capable military, whether you're talking about the British or whether you're talking about the ancient Greeks, there's usually a guy that um, um, is just a, you know, oh, just a brutal, brutal warrior, a guy that probably belongs in a cage for most of his life, um, except it, it's pretty useful to let him out of that cage if you ever have a war on your hand. Sherman was that guy, right? Sherman understood what he called the hard war, his terminology, not mine. And to that extent, he understood that when, when two societies are at war, it's the entirety of those societies. In other words, the civilian population is at war with everybody else in their oppositional uh, society. And so one of the things that you're going to see William Tecumseh Sherman do is take the war to the Confederate citizenry and not just defeating Confederate generals. Now, once again, he's very good on the actual battlefield. He's a very brilliant general, but his brilliance, if I may, in a military context, is not just defeating his adversaries on the battlefield. It's, it's, it's also burning down houses and emancipating slaves and... Uh, destroying the Confederate will to continue on in the war, okay? Now, this revelation of Union generals could not have come at a better time for Abraham Lincoln because 1864 was an election year. And there are oppositional candidates in the Democratic Party. Um, in, um, 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 in particular, they're referred to as Peace Democrats because uh, they're offering up peace as their political platform. Vote for us, and we will, um, we will, we will negotiate a truce and end this bloody war. Well, one of the guys that was uh, a general in the Union Army earlier on in the in the fight was a guy by the name of George McClellan. And one of the things that Lincoln couldn't get him to do was actually engage the enemy, and he seemed very reluctant to suffer any kind of heavy casualties. Well, as it turns out, he had ambitions for the presidency in 1864, and as you can imagine, it's pretty difficult to convince somebody to vote for you when you manage to get their son killed. 
right? So anyway, that kind of sheds a little bit of light on the situation when it comes to Lincoln's early struggles with respect to the war, okay? But a couple things that I need you to be mindful of when it comes to the November 1864 election. There were two southern cities that had basically been laid siege to. In other words, the Union Army was surrounding them and they were fighting to the last man that ultimately would, would, would collapse on the eve of the, uh, well, so to speak, uh, the eve of the election. One was Richmond, Virginia, which was the Confederate capital, and probably even more important would be Atlanta, Georgia, the, the, the heartland of the deep Confederacy. Now, in Atlanta, it's General uh, Sherman that is in charge of this siege, and even though they fought um, heroically, the Confederates ultimately abandoned the city, and it's at that point that Sherman and his troops more or less burned Atlanta to the ground. Um, now, what I'd like you to understand about those two victories, both in Richmond and in Atlanta, is they just set shockwaves of optimism all throughout the North. I mean, Lincoln sailed to victory in 1864. And not only Lincoln, but Republicans across the board. They, they picked up seats in both houses of Congress. They won governor's races. They did very well all across the board. And it goes back to military success. It goes back to winning on the battlefield, okay? Now, after Atlanta fell, Sherman devised this plan to what he called make Georgia howl, right? It was called the March to the Sea, and what Sherman does is he disconnects himself from both his supply lines and his communication lines. And the reason that he does this is he's going to live off the Confederate land. He's going to cut a bloody swath, his terminology not mine, through western Georgia all the way to the coast in Savannah, the easternmost point of Georgia, right, northeastern Georgia. He manages to arrive in Savannah on Christmas Eve, 1864, and in his path, in other words, from Atlanta to Savannah, is nothing but death, carnage, and destruction. Uh, houses were burned, farms destroyed, property destroyed, um, civilians terrorized. Now, this is significant on a number of different levels. Number one, that memory of the March to the Sea still lives on to some extent in Georgia to this day. And the other thing is, if you are stationed in Virginia, you're fighting Grant up in Virginia, um, if you get word that they're not taking prisoners in Georgia, so to speak, um, you might be very inclined to say, you know what, to heck with uh, what's going on here in, in, in Virginia. I'm going home to check on my farm, okay? So anyway, this has a number of different uses for the Union Army and Lincoln's government, generally speaking, and it really is the beginning of the end. Um, on Christmas Day, 1864, uh, uh, Sherman presented Savannah, Georgia as a Christmas present to Abraham Lincoln. And in the aftermath of that, Abraham Lincoln made every, um, every uh, uh, last Thursday in November a national day of Thanksgiving. Okay. Anyway. Back on to the um, back on to uh, the war itself. In the winter of 1864-1865, basically it's all over. But Lee and the Confederacy is not going to acknowledge that. The fighting resumed again in the spring of 1865. But for the most part, Lee's armies lacked guns, they lacked troops, and most importantly, they lacked money. As a matter of fact, uh, a lot of these Confederate troops can't even afford to put shoes or boots on their feet. Okay. In 1865, even though heavy fighting had continued up until that point, uh, Grant had basically surrounded Lee and cut him off from all of those supply lines, which at that point Lee knows everything is over and there's no, nothing left for him to do, in, in his words, but to go see General Grant. Now, these two men were West Point graduates, but they had never actually met in real life. Um, they go to meet at this courthouse in Virginia called Appomattox Courthouse. And that's the official end point in the war. The Appomattox is the place where Lee surrenders his, his, his armies to Grant. Okay? Now I need you to understand something about Grant. What Grant insisted upon was an unconditional surrender. That's why I said it's an easy way to remember his name. U.S. Grant, Unconditional Surrender Grant. Okay? But anyway, um, Grant insisted that Lee surrendered unconditionally, meaning there's no strings attached. There's no negotiation. Uh, okay, we're going to end the war, but we get to preserve slavery. Nothing like that. 
So technically, what we can do if we, the American government wants to is execute people like Robert E. Lee. It can execute anybody that took up arms and fought in the Confederacy that aided the Confederacy in any kind of direct way, any kind of indirect way, because from a very technical standpoint, in some cases, that is treason. Taking up arms against the United States is treason, which is punishable by death. Um, we don't execute Lee or virtually anybody else for their participation in the Confederacy. Okay, If you're interested, Lee is put under house arrest for more, more or less for the rest of his life and they build a massive Union graveyard in his backyard so every day that he got up and he was drinking his tea he'd have to look into his backyard and know that he caused all those deaths. Um, but for all intents and purposes, the South becomes a conquered territory. And in the next phase of our class, the, the next two lectures, we're going to talk about this process of putting the South back into the Union again. But for the time being, I want to talk to you about the only individual that was executed for his involvement in the American Civil War. And this guy was a na guy by the name of Henry Wirtz, W-I-R-Z, Wirtz. Wirtz was an Austrian-born uh, Confederate commander of a prisoner of war camp in Georgia called Andersonville. And the conditions in Andersonville um, rivaled what would later be known as the Nazi death camps in World War II. Massive amounts of suffering, undernourishment to say the very least. People were surviving on, you know, dozens, I guess you could say, of calories per day. Um, massive outbreaks of disease. There's not enough shelter. There's not enough uh, medical supplies. And that's that's an understatement. And it's not just that the Confederacy can't afford it, although it's pretty difficult for them to afford it. Wirtz pur purposefully kept some of those supplies from going into Andersonville and alleviating some of these sufferings. And so in the aftermath of this, when he's put on trial, He's the only person which, which the state is able to demonstrate was guilty of what you and I would consider to be war crimes, and he's executed for his role in Andersonville, not necessarily the, the, the war itself. Now, as I mentioned before, the South is a conquered territory, and the big challenge for Lincoln and his government after the war is over is to put everything back together again, which is going to be a lot more difficult than it sounds, and you'll see what I mean when we get to Reconstruction.